heartbreaking story out of Afghanistan. A daring escape. A New York Times reporter David Rode was abducted more than seven months ago. David Rode. David Rode of the New York Times vanished in the forbidding mountains of Afghanistan and Pakistan. Tonight he is a free man. This weekend he managed to get away from his captors. He found his way to a Pakistani army scout was able to get help and now we understand according to the New York Times reporting that he is at an American base in Bagram. Those breaking news reports came in June 2009 after Pulitzer Prize winning New York Times reporter David Rode escaped from Taliban captivity. In November 2008, he had been reporting from Afghanistan when he agreed to an in-person interview with the Taliban commander outside Kabul. But the planned interview turned into an ambush as Rode was kidnapped and taken to the volatile border region of North Waziristan in Pakistan, a Taliban and Al-Qaeda stronghold. Seven months later, Rode and his Afghan colleague made a daring middle-of-the-night escape as their captors slept, using a rope to scale the walls of their compound and make their way to safe haven at a nearby Pakistani military base. We're joined now by David Rode and his wife, Kristen Mulvihill, whose new book, A Rope and a Prayer, A Kidnapping from Two Sides, shows the impact of war on their family throughout David's harrowing seven-month 10-day captivity. I actually want to ask you why you decided to write it in the he said, she said narrative. We thought it was important to show both sides of the story and you know we got this attention but there are thousands of families in the military, there are diplomats, aid workers all working overseas in Iraq, Afghanistan and so many countries and they you don't see the other side of it. And what Kristen went through is just as important, if not more important, to what I went through. Well, yes. David obviously got all the attention. Yes. <laughs> what was it that you wanted to say about the spouse being at home? Yes. I mean, I, I hope the story resonates beyond kidnapping. You know, there are military families that are separated from their loved ones for months at a time. Um, and so I hope it resonates with anyone dealing with separation or in a position to make life and death decisions for a spouse when they're unable to do so for themselves. Um, and we just hope it personalizes the war, puts a personal face on the issue. And for you, you mm -hmm. are a professional, you're a photo yes. editor, you were here yes. working at Cosmopolitan magazine yes. while your husband was in captivity. Exactly, and we kept the case out of the news, um, which was something the family felt very strongly about. We did not want it publicized. So I went about my daily activities at work as a photo producer. Why did you decide to keep it out of the news? Did you, why did the news, New York Times want to do that, David? The, there was a general consensus among sort of security experts that um, if it's a government, if it's Iran, North Korea, go public. Mm -hmm. If it's a young militant, it, it doesn't help. It just mm -hmm. raises the hostage. And value. yet you recount that you did tell the militants that they could get money and, what, yes. and prisoners yes. released from Guantanamo. I did. That was whose after authority did you tell them? I, 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 I was in an effort, frankly, to save our lives. I was very worried about the lives of my two Afghan colleagues. And past kidnappings, the first thing they did was kill an Afghan to create the pressure. Um, and one of the problems we saw in writing this is that some governments do pay. There yes. have been a past case, an Italian journalist, five prisoners were released. There were some Korean hostages. There were rumors of millions being paid for them. But I was told um, an Al Jazeera film crew was on the way. Some Arab militants are coming with them, and they're going to decapitate you. I then said, you can get money and prisoners for us. What was going through your head? You'd just been married. Mm -hmm. You hadn't told Correct. Kristen that you were going off to do something this dangerous. Was that the right thing to do? It was the wrong thing to do. Um, you know, I regret the decision. It was completely unfair to her. I'll always regret it. I let competition get the best of me. Dozens of journalists have safely interviewed the Taliban, mm -hmm. and I wanted this to be the best book possible, but I, I lost my way, and I, I shouldn't have gotten so competitive. Well, I ask you about that, because your book is called A Rope and a Prayer. Yes. Prayer, faith, sustained yes. you. It did actually in family. Um, I had a practice as a ch I was raised Catholic and I really sort of fell back on prayer as a way to you know surrender without giving up. I ultimately knew the outcome was not going to be up to me and it really helped me maintain positivity and find that intention, um, written prayer actually, when I couldn't find that within myself mm. it kept me going. But you were not religious. No, and even from our time reporting in Bosnia, you know, we've seen, you know, religion taken to extremes can be a very destructive force. And I was with these young militants who had been deluded into thinking this was a religious war. They despised me because I was unclean, they said, because I wasn't Muslim. They didn't want to eat food from the same plate as me. They believed that the U.S. Army was, you know, forcibly converting Afghan 
Muslims to Christianity. But I, in my ca time in captivity, did end up saying prayers myself. I don't know. I'm still skeptical about organized religion. If a friend suddenly faced a deadly illness, I might suggest prayer. I don't know if some god reaches down and comforts you or it's a psychological trick. Let me ask you, because given that it was secret, the fact that he had been kidnapped, a lot of us knew, none of us yes. published it. It was a little James Bondy, the way you uh -huh. went after his release. Yes, it was. It was. Um, and we did, we did a bunch of things. Um, you know, the FBI swooped in very early on to tell the family how the case might progress, but they can't negotiate, they can't exchange funds or prisoners. Um, so we hired a private security team to try to negotiate on the phone with the Taliban. Um, I also had a, a friend by the name of Michael Semple, who was based in the region, who advised me. I tried to send in notes to David um, through Taliban elders. I, I don't know if they ever got to him um, or to the elders. I even, in fact, made a video at the request of a mullah close to the kidnappers that were holding him. He suggested, you know, the kidnappers have sent you several videos. Why don't you send one back? It might be a nice gesture. And you spoke to some of them on the phone. I did. I was called at home twice. Um, it was very surreal. They would always call with the stipulation that I look at the phone number and call them back. They didn't want to pay for the call, so <laughs> it was adding insult to injury. But it always gave me pause. It gave me a moment to catch my breath and sort of figure out what to say. Our, our conversations were highly scripted. Uh, between demanding millions of dollars and prisoners, they would say, you know, we're going to go off and pray, and inshallah, we'll get back to you. So it was very strange. And how excellent. long did it take for them to ever get back to you? Uh, you know, it would be weeks at a time, yeah. and it wouldn't necessarily be by mm -hmm. telephone, it may be through an emissary. What did you learn from these Taliban who had you? Are they more radical than you thought, less? What, what did you learn from them? They're very radical. It's very dangerous. I was held in the same place where Faisal Shahzad, the young man who tried to set off the truck bomb in Times Square, where he was trained. Mm -hmm. Nothing has changed since I escaped from captivity 17 months ago. The Obama administration has repeatedly asked the Pakistani military to remove this. It's a mini-state. They train suicide bombers. They do whatever they want. And the problem continues today, and they're carrying out cross-border attacks mm -hmm. and killing American servicemen mm -hmm. from this place. And indeed, the Afghan Review, the War Review, suggested that even the fragile progress that's been made in Afghanistan is threatened mm -hmm. precisely from North Waziristan. Do you see any willingness in your continued reporting by the Pakistanis to really crack down on that? It's all about India. And as long as there's mm -hmm. this India-Pakistan rivalry, um, the Pakistanis, they continue to see the Taliban as proxies they can use to stop India from coming in and making inroads in Afghanistan. Um, you know, Richard Holbrooke was trying to do this. He was trying to sort of reduce tensions between India and Pakistan. There are assurances that we can, you know, make to the Pakistanis, maybe ask the Indians to back off in Afghanistan. The Pakistani military is a rational actor. They don't agree with the Taliban. They're not secretly Islamists. So I think there is a solution. You know, I think we have to keep trying. And uh, it's this regional dynamic that will stabilize Afghanistan. So while he's thinking geopolitics and his particular yes. <laughs> area of reporting exactly. captive there exactly. and, and, and still, you're having to go about your daily work as a photo yes. editor at Cosmopolitan, yes. exactly. chatting with your colleagues. How did yes. that, I mean, how? It was very tough. I mean, actually, two weeks into the Without captivity. Without telling them. Yeah, two weeks into the captivity, I told the editor-in-chief, and she kept that secret throughout. She was tremendous. Um, as the time dragged on, I had to tell more people. But it was very strange the first few months. You know, I would be planning shoots and in the office, and I would get a call from the FBI. You know, we have a video communication of David. Can you duck out and meet us, you know, in front of Starbucks on 57th Street? Um, so it was it really was kind of like leading a double life mm -hmm. yeah. and you were able to call Christine yes. a couple mm -hmm. of times mm -hmm. they were very technologically adept they mm -hmm. had a Thuraya satellite phone they, they called on cell phones mm -hmm. um, and they even googled me so there was they what was so interesting was that they they were kind of globalization is happening in the tribal areas of Pakistan but they pick and choose whatever information sort of fits their mm -hmm. conspiracy theories so and what information about you fit their conspiracy theories as they googled you they, um, you know, basically saw the West as sort of hedonistic. They said that they hated the New York Times because it supported secularism. They, therefore, they were their enemies. They were so deluded that they, they thought that the, if you remember the kidnapping of the Somali pirate, I'm sorry, the Somali, the American sea captain by Somali pirates, they said, oh, no, no, those three pirates weren't shot. The United States government secretly paid a $25 million ransom. I mean, that's completely false, but that was the expectation mm -hmm. they had. After being there for seven months, how did you make the decision finally to decide to escape? Um, our captors' initial demands were $25 million and 15 prisoners being released from Guantanamo Bay, Cuba. Um, after seven months, they had reduced their demands to $8 million and the release of four prisoners. 
Um, they told me every day they had me, they were delivering massive political blows to the American government. I mean, I, I said, my case isn't even public, people don't care. I, I came to interview the Taliban, people are, are angry at me, and they were just delusional. And we just decided the only way um, you know, we could end this would be to try to escape. And they moved us to this house that was very close to that Pakistani base. And uh, we didn't think it worked, work, and uh, it did. We're so lucky. And you snuck out while they were asleep? Um, we had an, uh, a ceiling fan in the room where we slept with the guards, and there was an old air conditioner called a cooler, and it made a tremendous amount of noise. And that was what made us, you know, with the power back on, we decided that that kind of covered up the sound we made. And I had found the rope. Uh, it was a car tow rope, and we made it to the roof, lowered ourselves down that wall, and, um, you know, it's just a miracle. <laughs> How did you hear he was released? Uh, David called home and my mother picked up and she took notes on a post-it pad so when I ran home there were all these little stickies strewn across the living room uh, and very quickly we got on the phone um, we called the New York Times and they sent the editor over to the house and um, between the three of us you know we contacted Hillary Clinton we contacted Richard Holbrook who'd been fantastic throughout and they in turn contacted the Pakistanis we, they said we know where David is please make sure he's exited safely from the region. Meantime as Kristen was doing that you had barely escaped with your life. Yeah. Well, the Pakistanis thought that they might need to shoot you. There was, uh, we got to the edge, we went over that wall, as you talked about, we get to this base, we're nearly shot because, you know, I have a beard down to here and I'm in local clothes. They, they take us on this base, and I, I really want to emphasize this, this very brave young Pakistani captain, he was a moderate, and he apologized to me for the kidnapping, allowed us on the base, let me make that crucial mm -hmm. call home because I thought other Pakistani officers might hand us back to the Taliban. There are moderates in Pakistan and Afghanistan. Most of the population opposes the Taliban, and I'm here today because a moderate Afghan and a moderate Pakistani helped me. And I think it's vital that people know that, and we want this book to be more about the moderates, in a sense, than about my kidnappers. And do you allow your husband to go back to Afghanistan? <laughs> well, I actually didn't have to tell him not to go back again. He came to that conclusion on his own. And do you want to go I'm, back? I don't. My days as a war correspondent are over, and I'm you know, just so lucky to be home. And again, we wrote this because we're just one small story. This is mm -hmm. kind of this hidden war that most Americans doesn't, it doesn't really affect their daily lives. Such a small percentage of Americans serve in the military or overseas. So, you know, this is just one small story of, of what's happening to sort of tens of thousands of Americans, as well as, you know, average Afghans and Pakistanis. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you both very much indeed, David, Kristen, thanks very much thank indeed. And, and I hope people read it and get that message from you both. Thank thanks. You. Thank you. Mm -hmm.